following program is brought to you by Caltech. Okay, so if we're ready to reconvene. I know Keck runs a really tight ship here, so I'm supposed to start exactly at 11. One minute. Okay, so let's see, just two uh, small postscripts from uh, the end of the last part, uh, somebody came up to me and rightly pointed out that I simply said ICE-1 without explaining what that was. That's a didactically a terrible thing to do. So ICE-1 is uh, ice under normal laboratory pressures. It's what's in our ice cubes. And then the high pressure ices um, are uh, you know, ICE-3, ICE-5, ICE-7, and so on. Uh, the important point is that ICE-1 is less dense than liquid water, and even less dense than uh, most ammonia water solutions. So it forms a solid crust on top of this interior ocean, and then the high pressure ices form underneath that. And in the case of Titan, except for the very earliest part of its history, all models of Titan's interior, regardless of their assumptions, the liquid water layer with ammonia is sandwiched between the low pressure ice and the high pressure ice. Somebody else said to me, well, gee, is your model consistent with the somewhat large moment of inertia of Titan? And I said, no. Uh, and it preceded that. But we're working on seeing whether we can preserve water in the silicates, hydrated silicates bound water. Uh, and um, I'm actually working with Julie Castillo at JPL on this. So um, we'll see. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to talk any more about the gravity. The gravity data are really still in flux. Uh, you'll see that on the list of, of needed measurements uh, that probably will be accomplished during the Cassini mission. But I think that story is, is still um, uh, one that's going to be improved over the next few years. So let me close this portion uh, with uh, the two wild and crazy ideas. They're not wild and crazy in the sense of being idiosyncratic. They're just generically speculative. One is the question of whether there could be life on Titan, and the other is whether Titan might be a useful model for the late stages of the evolution of the Earth's uh, hydrosphere and hydrologic cycle. Uh, so th this is kind of a, a, a very old story now, because it, it dates back to a thoughtful paper by Steve Benner and colleagues in 2004 uh, in a somewhat obscure chemistry journal. But the issue is that we, we've all been taught in a sort of a generic way that water is essentially the most suitable medium for life. And of course, this is a very circular kind of conclusion because the life that we study and the biochemistry that is associated with that life um, is a biochemistry that works in liquid water. So of course, it's not going to work in a very different kind of liquid. The issue is, is there any kind of organized chemistry, organized enough that one could create information-carrying molecules that could uh, uh, replicate uh, and produce uh, catalysts of certain types that would allow for reactions to be controlled and sustained? Could that happen in liquid hydrocarbons? And the answer is nobody knows. But um, there are some features of liquid hydrocarbons that are interesting, as Steve Benner has pointed out. Of course, they're suitable for low temperature. That's why we're talking about uh, them for Titan. We're talking about methane and ethane. Um, they do actually, because uh, methane and ethane themselves don't hydrogen bond, the liquids are uh, involved very weak van der Waals interactions between uh, the molecules of the solvents, they would in turn allow other kinds of organic molecules themselves to, to do hydrogen bonding, uh, which is something that liquid water does uh, in terms of the hydrogen from one water molecule 
having a, a modestly strong or modestly weak bond, depending on your point of view, with an oxygen on another water molecule. And ammonia in water can do this too. That provides structure in the liquid water and uh, essentially uh, allows molecules to be either hydrophobic or hydrophilic, but it prevents those organic molecules from doing very much with hydrogen bonding. And what Steve Benner has speculated is there might be a kind of a useful chemistry in which the organic molecules themselves are doing this. Um, there is some solubility of other hydrocarbons in the liquid methane and ethane, and there might be enough polar hydrocarbons, um, enough uh, uh, ionic uh, type interactions, perhaps ions generated by cosmic rays, that there might be a way to, to have the equivalent of hydrophilic and hydrophobic um, uh, activity in these liquids. Uh, but certainly, they would be dominated by carbon-nitrogen bonding rather than carbon-oxygen bonding. No, R no DNA, no RNA, and no proteins. But a criticism about these, that, that things are not very soluble in them, is, is probably not right. Um, solubilities have actually not been well measured because of the very low temperatures, and uh, they need to be properly measured, and that experiment is uh, underway uh, or being started at JPL uh, by Rob Hodas. In the meantime, if you just do very simple kind of ideal solution calculations, uh, which is what uh, Cordier uh, and uh, several of us did, which was published recently, uh, what you find is that um, for tightened conditions and for the best thermodynamic data we could find, that some of the constituents that we know to be present uh, in the chemical products in Titan's atmosphere, and which fall out onto the surface, have moderately respectable solubilities. Uh, we're talking about a few percent, uh, even up to 10 percent for acetylene, uh, on the order of a percent for benzene, maybe 0.02 percent. So uh, these, if, if they're anywhere close to what really happens, uh, are, are, are not too bad. They're somewhat interesting uh, and uh, potentially allow for some uh, chemical interactions. The other interesting thing about Titan uh, in terms of a kind of primitive life is that there seems to be in the chemistry a, a natural way to carry ultraviolet photons from the sun down to the surface, and that is the production of acetylene. So again, two methanes go to form acetylene. Um, acetylene itself can then undergo reactions uh, at the surface, uh, ranging from uh, just conversion to benzene, uh, conversion to um, polyacetylenes, uh, or possibly, if there's a source of hydrogen, conversion back to methane. But because the bonds are unsaturated, there's a significant amount of stored chemical energy. And so this acetylene made in the atmosphere has sort of three fates to it. It can end up just going directly down to the surface as uh, an ice, as a solid, uh, it can be converted to ethane, uh, which goes down to the surface as well, uh, or it can be converted to very uh, heavy hydrocarbons and nitriles, things called tholins. And it's this pathway that might be interesting, and which has been the subject of speculation in the literature by Chris McKay um, and uh, Harold Smith, and then by uh, Grinspoon and, and Dirk Schultz and several others, as to what chemistry might be done with this on the surface. Uh, the evidence from the Cassini data, and I think now this really is benzene, I hope. Um, maybe not. Should be. Uh, it's C6H6. The, the, um, there, there is in the VIMS data, the near-infrared data, evidence for deposits of benzene over large parts of the surface. And what's surprising about this, this is a paper coming out in JGR this year by Roger Clark and colleagues, is that they should also be able to see acetylene, and they don't. So relative to what is produced in the atmosphere, where the acetylene to benzene ratio is much greater than one, what's evident on the surface of Titan is an acetylene to benzene ratio that's much less than one. Now, of course, you can always cover things on the surface, so you have to be careful. But the real place to resolve this question is actually in the lakes and seas, where these would both be dissolved and you could measure them directly. 
What McKay and Smith speculated on in 2005 was that if there were sources of hydrogen in the crust, um, or you know, even scavenged out of the atmosphere, although there's not very much there, that uh, in fact some kind of chemistry, primitive biology, call it whatever you will, might uh, actually convert the acetylene back to uh, methane. Uh, that these would be essentially methanogens, the equivalent of methanogens. And actually, this amount of, of energy of conversion, the energy that you get from the conversion, is more than enough to sustain methanogens, terrestrial methanogenic organisms, although they would not be obviously relevant to the hydrocarbon lakes. That's, that's clearly the case. So this is as far as these speculations go, except that uh, Steve Benner uh, at the Astrobiology Conference in Houston uh, two weeks ago had this uh, very interesting abstract in which he asked what would happen if these hydrocarbon systems were in contact with water, not liquid water, which isn't stable, but water in these aquifer systems, in the, in the crust in the northern hemisphere. Maybe you could get uh, these kinds of compounds forming. And he argued that uh, some of these, uh, well, the ethanol and the propanol, uh, could perhaps, uh, under certain conditions, produce uh, the equivalent of an information-carrying polymer, uh, where the propanol and the ethanol were the equivalent of the nucleic acid bases. Uh, you know, clearly, this isn't chemistry. This is fun. It's speculation at the moment. But um, it, it leads, it sort of opens up a number of possibilities that should be thought about, especially in terms of what you would want to try to detect in surface deposits and also in the lakes. So. Um, the last um, point, then, Titan is a model for future Earth runaway. I've actually already talked about this right at the beginning. The key point here is that the Earth's hydrologic cycle uh, involves a volatile which is very tightly bound to the troposphere because the temperature minimum at the tropopause, 190 Kelvin, uh, is, uh, leads to a, um, a water mixing ratio in the stratosphere that is only 10 parts per million, several orders of magnitude below that at the surface. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, the loss of water is very, very small. Now, eventually, uh, as the sun continues to increase in brightness, uh, one will see a change in that situation. This is an old plot by Jim Casting showing altitude versus water mixing ratio for the Earth's atmosphere. And this is roughly what we have at present for a effective temperature of 260 Kelvin, a surface temperature of 280 or so. Um, the Vic mixing ratio, again, uh, less than 10 parts per million uh, at the tropopause. Now, as the sun's luminosity goes up, these temperature profiles shift, but they also change shape. And in particular, because they are expressed as volume mixing ratio, and because that mixing ratio of water depends exponentially on the temperature at the tropopause, a small change in surface temperature of, uh, in this case, about 60 degrees, uh, leads to um, a change in the volume mixing ratio of, of almost two orders of magnitude. And actually, by the time you get to 340, it becomes very steep. You get a volume mixing ratio of a part per thousand of water instead of uh, a few parts per million or 10 parts per million. And uh, as you move further, you get into situations where the mixing ratio is like that of Titan. So now, water um, between these two states, where the surface temperature is 340 and 360 Kelvin, somewhere in the 1.1, probably closer to 1.5 times the present solar luminosity, water is lost from the troposphere and is lost to the Earth's system in a time scale on the order of tens of millions of years, or 100 million years, which is just the same as methane on Titan today. Take out the word water and put in the word methane. Uh, now, of course, um, on Venus, uh, there was this enormous uh, runaway where large amounts of CO2 that were then present in the system amplified the greenhouse effect and led to a completely dry surface that's above the critical point of water. The speculation would be that because the uh, carbonate cycle has led to most of the CO2 that was originally in the Earth's system 
being locked up today as carbonates and therefore inert, except what is recycled through plate tectonics, that the end state of the Earth may not be like that of Venus because there's not a lot of CO2 to amplify this effect, but in fact might look something more like that picture I showed you uh, of the methane cycle on Titan with the dry equatorial region, um, the possibility for stable liquid water at the poles, but certainly below the critical point of water. So one might potentially learn something about the ultimate future history of the Earth uh, by studying the climate of Titan. And whether we do or we don't, um, I want to close this part of the, the lecture by pointing out that, again, we think about our sun as the typical main sequence star in the galaxy, but it's not. Uh, M dwarfs, the coolest main sequence stars, outnumber the sun by 100 to 1. And uh, if you imagine the equivalent of our solar system around an M dwarf, you have to move the Earth into 0.1 AU or further in in order to get the same effective temperature, which should be 258 Kelvin. In this region, uh, the Earth is tidally locked to the parent star, so one side always faces the parent star. Coronal mass ejections and uh, flares and stellar wind will remove the Earth's atmosphere unless there's a strong magnetic field. There are a number of effects you can list, but the point is that you cannot simply say that we can take the Earth environment that we know and make an analogy for an equivalent around an M dwarf uh, because the planet has to be so close to the M dwarf that the stellar environment, both gravitationally and in terms of energetics, now dominates the environment of that planet in ways that have no analog for the Earth. So the Earth's climate is not an analog for an Earth-sized planet around an M dwarf at 0.1 AU. It's not. It's completely different. Titan, on the other hand, moved from 10 AU to 1 AU. This is a perfectly fine environment. There's no tidal locking, uh, stellar flares and coronal mass ejections, although M dwarfs are somewhat more active than G dwarfs, wouldn't really be very different from that that we experience here. And so um, Titan is probably a good analog for a planet at 1 AU from an M dwarf, which may then, because of this problem for the Earth, this might be the most common kind of stable, long-term, active volatile cycling that occurs on planets in the cosmos. That is, it involves methane and not water. So anyway. Um, you can do with that what you want. Uh, I've actually, I'll leave some reprints on that point uh, in the back, and um, uh, it probably is um, not going to get us more time on James Webb Space Telescope, but who knows. So um, here are key questions about Titan. Uh, I want to start by uh, just listing some of the things that the Cassini Extended Mission uh, is uh, probably going to be able to do. Um, this is a wonderful mission, but we're, we are still limited by the kinds of instrumentation that's on Cassini. And as always happens with planetary missions, as soon as you discover very interesting things about a place with a particular instrument payload, you then formulate questions that really cannot be addressed with that instrument payload. And that's just the nature of science. But there are things that can be addressed, and one is seasonal changes. If Cassini continues to remain healthy, It'll be able to observe through to northern summer solstice, and so it will continue to make southern hemisphere observations as long as that area is lit, and beyond that with the radar, hopefully see some strong seasonality. Uh, Alex Hayes, in his 2007 paper, uh, made some specific predictions about the smaller lakes versus the larger seas, and how they would change uh, in the case of connection to an aquifer system versus the presence of just isolated lakes. That's something that Cassini should be able to observe. Um, that convective uh, rainfall pattern in the southern hemisphere uh, is uh, something that should be reproduced in the north, uh, and one should be able to see that. Now, one thing I didn't have time to show and just flashed by were some very interesting observations by Emily Schaller and colleagues of cloud outburst in the mid-latitude, actually the equatorial region of Titan. And ground-based observations, uh, like what Emily and her group are doing, 
can observe Titan continuously, whereas Cassini cannot. And one of the things that they are seeing potentially is more cloud activity at low latitudes than are actually predicted by the global circulation models. So in fact, uh, it's important to, uh, uh, to consider that the Cassini observations uh, really need to continue to be accompanied by ground-based monitoring programs, uh, which uh, have been able to see outbursts that Cassini just has completely missed. Um, now, as a spring goes on in the north and the sun climbs higher in the sky and the polar latitudes, there's the opportunity to map the composition of the seas in the north as was done in the south, and one fully expects to see ethane, although one of the puzzles about those VIMS observations is that the ethane, uh, the depth of that ethane feature was very, very shallow, and uh, it, if it's a deep lake, it, it really ought to be a deeper feature. So there's something's going on there in those observations that perhaps with the more extensive lakes in the north will be resolved. And at high altitude, uh, there's a rich chemistry that I really uh, did not uh, give credit to. Uh, ask Sarah Hurst about it because she's exploring it. Um, all this chemistry in the upper atmosphere and the seasonal asymmetries that occur up there uh, should result perhaps in changes in that chemistry that will be explored with the INMS data. Um, and then Cassini also can provide for future Titan missions, completing the maps of the large seas which are only seen partially in radar strips. Now this may already have been done because the VIMS uh, instrument was able to get an image of one of the large seas that's incompletely mapped, Kraken Mare, uh, which uh, shows convincingly even more, I, th I think, than the ISS data, I've been told, because I haven't been allowed to see this image yet, that Kraken Mare is a, a very large feature. Uh, we all, on Cassini, we share data like we're all cousins and uncles and aunts and um, feuding relatives and so on, but that's the nature of a large mission, so um, I haven't seen these data yet. I'd like to. Uh, and then um, one thing that is really crucial that... Um, has not been done yet, despite due diligence by the RSS team, is to get enough high-quality flybys to complete um, the mapping of the, uh, of the low-order gravitational moments, to look for tidal flexing, which would be evidence, even with a, a 50 kilometer thick crust, uh, should be some evidence uh, through the value of the tidal love number K2 for the presence of a liquid water ocean. This seems to be doable with the quality of the data that Cassini is getting, but requires probably at least four more RSS flybys. And of course, when you consider the fact, RSS is radio science subsystem. When you consider the fact that the spacecraft cannot be doing anything else during those flybys, there is a lot of arguing among the different instruments about whether they want the radio science team to have four quiet flybys. So, uh, there are all sorts of other ideas, like using the low-gain antenna and various other things. But uh, from my personal point of view, if Cassini does not uh, finish out its extended, extended mission, having determined whether the, uh, uh, the gravity data are consistent with the presence of an ocean or not, if it does not finish up that way, that will be a major loss, because it can do that with the flybys that are available. Now, as far as um, beyond Cassini, post-Cassini science questions, I have about three of these. And uh, you can make your own list, of course. Um, these will be available, and they're certainly incomplete. Uh, each of these is a set of questions, and then the, the measurements that uh, might be used to address these. And Pat Beecham will uh, notice that this is very familiar because it's from the TSSM report. But you know, why mess around with a fine bottle of champagne if it's, it tastes good? Just keep drinking it. So uh, we have uh, different kinds of measurements color-coded. Blue is an orbiter, a close flyby spacecraft. Orbiter is preferred. Red is a mobile aerial platform, and green is some kind of a surface lander. And I have, I've changed some of these around, so it's a, it's a somewhat updated list. Um, what are the lakes and seas made of, and what really is flowing in the rivers, and is it flowing today, and how extensive is fluvial erosion? So direct measurement, again, from a lander of lake sea composition. Orbiter spectral imaging, not out to 5 microns, but out at least to 5.6 microns, because there are a number of strong 
hydrocarbon features that VIMS can't see because it goes out to 5.1 and has no sensitivity there. Um, with a good resolving power and reasonable resolution, this has to be traded off with coverage. I think that 50 meter imaging, which is actually in the, the, the Titan Saturn system mission document, the flagship document, I'm not sure that's really enough. So I've changed that to 10 to 20 meter imaging, which we're not going to get from an orbiter, but we would get from a mobile platform. And I am influenced by looking at these um, ground base, these, sorry, these Earth orbiting uh, radar images of places like Rome or other places where the fluvial features are very evident. Now, if you degraded that Rome image to 50 meters instead of 20, you would still see most of the fluvial features, but they would begin to get washed out. So this would be better, certainly at least 50 meters. And then getting better temperatures so that we know what the temperatures in the lakes really are, so we can work out the physical chemistry going on there. Um, is there active volcanism? I haven't talked too much about this. I've shown you none of the radar pictures that purport to show uh, the equivalent of volcanic flows, but in water ice, so-called cryovolcanic flows. And that is because um, they don't look very good. They're hard to interpret. It's not like pictures of the flows on Venus. Part of that is the great distance of the radar from the surface of Titan. The signal to noise is just low. And part of it may be that they're not really cryovolcanic flows. We don't know. So one needs much better imaging and probably, instead of radar, to try to do this in the near infrared. Um, global topography over certain areas in order to see whether, in fact, uh, the kind of, um, of topography in that region, the profiles that you get, are typical of lava flows or of things like pediments and alluvial fans, because some of these things actually also look like alluvial fans at the radar wavelengths. Um, Certainly mapping of volcanic gases, uh, if in fact one can catch active geysers, um, that cloud outburst that Schaller and colleagues saw could have been caused by a methane geyser. That's one way to trigger a large episode of methane convection. Um, but even mapping in areas uh, that might have these cryovolcanic features, even mapping carbon dioxide deposits on the surface would be crucial because patchy areas of carbon dioxide would indicate material brought up from the interior. And while you'd like to do that with methane, methane's a liquid at these conditions, so it doesn't stay in one place. So you have to look for something else. And that something else could be ammonia or it could be CO2. And CO2 is actually easier to see. And there may be some evidence for it from the VIMS data. And then surface seismometry to see if there are crustal movements. Um, how are these polymers made in the atmosphere? What is their distribution and deposition? Much higher sensitivity and resolution mass spectrometry and measurement of composition dynamics below 900 kilometers. Now, how do you get down to 400 kilometers? You build a spacecraft without too many delicate things sticking out, and you put it in an elliptical orbit, and you fly it down to 400 kilometers. You can actually, in the Titan-Saturn system mission study, it was shown that you could fly that spacecraft down to 700 kilometers with no problem. Um, now, could you do it down to 400? Depends on the spacecraft. Uh, and when and how do the heavy rains occur? Uh, this could be from a mobile platform or close flyby, but deep atmospheric measurements to one kilometer accuracy to understand the static stability of the atmosphere. Uh, and then selective imaging to see if one can actually get, uh, certainly with this higher resolution, determine whether these things that look like convective clouds really are convective clouds. So what is, is there a rock metal core? The moment of inertia data would say there shouldn't be, but maybe there is a um, metal core and, and, and the lack of differentiation is further out. Um, who knows? How thin is the crust? Well, some of this is, would have to be done by measuring induced magnetic fields and looking for permanent magnetic fields, in the case of the rock metal core. To do any of this, to look for a, a, a faint dipolar field and to look for induced magnetic fields, uh, could be done with an orbiter that gets below the ionosphere, or the bulk of the ionosphere. Again, something in an elliptical orbit that can handle the air densities down at 700, 600, 500 kilometers. At least some of that seems to be possible. Um, global gravity mapping uh, to much higher degree and order. Global topography, 
uh, again, and surface seismometry. Loss rates of the major gases. I haven't discussed this. There's actually um, a, a debate about uh, whether methane is lost not only through chemistry, but direct escape. And uh, that's based on Cassini measurements. Uh, it would help to get uh, a better quantification of the detection of energetic particles, the, the amount of energetic particles, their energy spectrum, to try to detect Titan material that's uh, escaped from Titan within the Saturn system. Um, and um, I'm not sure what this is doing here. Uh, and then getting a rotational spectra of molecules uh, and uh, measuring the conditions in this region. Because it's in this 400 to 900 kilometer region that escape really begins and also aerosol formation occurs. And so all of that physics is, is a lot of that physics we're missing by not being down in that region. Um, the last one of the, this uh, laundry list, I know it's a laundry list. Um, what is the vertical extent and composition of the subcrustal ocean? Hopefully we'll get that with Cassini, at least in part. But there's this intriguing measurement of electric fields and their altitude dependence from the Huygens probe. And the interpretation that those electric fields are generated, um, they're, that they're actually a Schumann resonance within a cavity that's defined at the top by the ionosphere. And at the bottom, not by the crust, but by a conducting layer. Uh, and the altitude profile seems to be consistent with that. Uh, that conducting layer being the ocean, 50 kilometers or 90 kilometers below the surface. So doing this better, I think, would be important. Um, and uh, this was listed in the Ta Titan Saturn System Mission Study, but maybe it will be done by Cassini. Hopefully, it will. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thank you. It's very close. Right. It's not quite. Right. And there are at least, in my view of things, two ways that could be. Either the dissipation is small, and there's something like the atmosphere that's exciting the spin bolt to be far from there. Right. Or if the dissipation is very large, then the damp spin bolt actually moves away from where it would be in the low dissipation case. And you might say, well, that's just a hypothetical, but the spin bolt trajectory. Ah, okay. And the radar measurements are good enough that mm -hmm. my expectation is that by the time the Cassini mission is done, we will be able to resolve whether it's too much dissipation or too little dissipation. Right. And if it's too much dissipation, that would, would guarantee an ocean, but it would be strongly suggested. Suggested. That's actually an important one to put on the Cassini list then. Yep, okay, good point. Uh, let's see, okay, the final two of these. Um, one would like a direct indication that there really is ammonia in the crust and subcrustal part of, of uh, Titan, uh, where the ocean should be. Methanol is a potential substitute or equivalent for ammonia in depressing the melting point uh, both of, of water. Both of these should be detectable on the surface with suitable reflectance spectroscopy or even direct sampling of surface materials by some kind of GC mass spec. And then, if one goes to the lakes, uh, well, surely you want to go there sampling with mass spectrometry, uh, 2DGC. Uh, the, whether the idea of life in the lakes is plausible or not, the lakes are a repository for organic compounds from all around Titan, not just with sediments into the lakes, but the determination of Titan's shape suggests that both the North Polar Region and the South Polar Region are depressed. Uh, in elevation relative to a sphere. And material, you know, that could be the general direction of the fluvial erosion. We don't know because we can't map the fluvial channels. But if it is, then stuff from all over Titan is being carried into these lakes. And that's where you want to sample it. That's where it's all residing. Uh, and then, of course, there's a whole list of things you might want to measure, see if organic, there are any chiral materials, and if there's an antiomeric excess. Look for inorganic catalysts that might be crucial for all of this. There's always meteoritic material raining down on Titan. It may play an important role in some of the organic chemistry. Uh, these would all need to be done from the surface. There can also be spectral mapping done from orbit. And again, this is only a partial list. But as we discuss uh, how to do measurements and what kind of measurements to do, 
over the next three or four days. I'll leave you with this Vim's image of the sea glint off of uh, one of the northern seas of Titan, taken a, a, um, some months ago as uh, Equinox uh, had, had arrived. And uh, remember that this is a place that's interesting to explore, not only because it's an extreme environment, but because it, it is a mysterious new kind of environment that in some ways uh, echoes what's on the Earth, but in other ways uh, is, as Swinburne said, stranger than death, whatever that may be. So let's not lose our romantic sense about this place as we study to death how to get there. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Caltech. Visit us at caltech.edu.